Good morning. Today is Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. Keeping kosher is a major part of Jewish religious life, and keeping kosher is very complicated. First, because keeping kosher is actually a nexus of many different mitzvos, and each one of them has its own details and complexities. And number two, there are many different standards of what it means to keep kosher because there are many issues about which there are disputes among halachic authorities. What is the correct approach to take? And now there are hundreds, many hundreds of kosher supervising agencies all over the world question is, which ones are okay? Which ones are not okay? Why are they not okay? Which ones should I follow? How do I know what to do? So the answer is not Facebook. I am amazed to see posts of serious questions about kashrus, about other Jewish subjects, serious questions where a person is simply asking Facebook What's the halacha? What should I do? It's just amazing to me with predictably confusing results when any competent rabbi could easily clarify this subject. Okay, that's the modern world. And the answer is not reading the label for two reasons. Number one, by law, significant amounts of ingredients are not required to be listed. So a label is not a complete listing of everything that is in that product. So you don't know if there is a non-kosher ingredient just by reading the label. That's number one. And number two, it requires great expertise to know what many of the ingredients are. They have names with many syllables that are not recognizable to almost all of us unless we have a science background or biology, chemistry background. And we will not know, unless we have extreme expertise in this area, which of these ingredients has, in fact, a kashrus problem that needs to be explored. So one cannot legitimately rely on reading labels in order to keep kosher. Let me provide some context and background to this subject, and I want to provide this by suggesting that there are three groups of kashrus certifying organizations. Number one, there's a list, many, that are recommended. Now, I refer to this as the OU standard because the OU is the largest by far, the most recognized and the most respected in the world. And they are, in fact, responsible for developing most of the practices for modern kashra supervision that are used by all of the kashra organizations. Now, those standards include, number one, the personal qualities of each of the mashkichim, the checkers, the supervisors that go to visit the factories and plants, not only a level of expertise in Jewish law, but also a level of scientific and engineering and uh, technology knowledge to be able to understand what they are seeing and to verify what they're seeing, in addition to a very strong code of ethics of how they should act. They represent, when they go to a plant, they represent not only the cautious organization, they represent the Jewish people and they must act with a very high level of ethics, and that is extremely important. In addition to that, I referred to this for the supervisors, but the entire organization must have access to the best, most up-to-date food scientists, engineers, computer experts, chemists, biologists, all of the industry professionals, because 
So much of this is absolutely essential to being able to properly supervise products as being kosher. And number three, the OU has clear guidelines of normative Jewish law based on the sources. And again, those organizations that are recommended will follow these standards. So organizations, the OU, the OK, the Star K, the MK here in Montreal, the COR in Toronto, the best source for a list of recommended symbols, kashra symbols, is the CRC website, CRC, Chicago Rabbinical Council. It's easy to find. CRC website. They have an excellent Kashrus website, including a list of recommended symbols, and I recommend whatever is listed there without hesitation. They are a wonderful and very transparent and open source of qualified and legitimate Kashrus information. CRC website. Number two, sadly, there are organizations, Kashrus supervising agencies, that are not recommended. Sometimes the person listed as being in charge is no longer living, but they keep, still keep using his name. It sounds like a joke, but unfortunately this happens. Also in this category or organizations, again, sad to say, who have a callous application of Jewish law, such as making rare or even no visits to certify and to verify that what they say is kosher is in fact kosher. And another category of problems with these non-recommended organizations is that they hold opinions in Jewish law, which are rejected by virtually all halakhic authorities. For example, certain organizations will allow carmine. Now, carmine is a natural red food coloring. It's used in quite a number of foods. Whenever natural coloring is listed, it could include carmine. The word car carmine is rarely there. Carmine is derived from beetles. Beetles, the insects, they're not kosher. Another big problem is some of these organizations allow the use of gelatin. Gelatin is made from pork and non-kosher beef. And virtually all halakhic authorities consider it non-kosher, and yet these organizations allow it. Such organizations are not recommended. Third, there's a middle ground. Organizations or symbols that can be used on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is because the people in charge are knowledgeable and reliable, but in certain areas, they hold an opinion that is at variance with normative standards. Let me share a few examples. Now, I'm not going to mention the names because my examples are a few years old. My experience in kosher supervision goes back over a period of almost 40 years. And also, I have given you my advice that you should follow whatever is on the CRC website, and these following examples are not on that website. So I'm sharing these examples for illustration purposes only. One is the subject of glot versus non-glot meat. Glot is a Yiddish word that means smooth, and narrowly it applies to checking the lungs of an animal after slaughter to see if there are any lesions that might render the animal non-kosher. If it is smooth glot, that's glot, and if it's non-glot, that means that there are certain adhesions that are still being permitted to be used. This is a very complicated subject. What exactly are the lesions? What do we do with them? What's the standard to use? But practically speaking, 
Glut meat products are usually, not always, but usually treated with higher standards than non-glut. And this applies to areas that go far beyond dealing with lesions in the lungs. For example, now I know this example firsthand, though it goes back a number of years. There's a non, uh, I'm sorry, a large non-glut meat processor. They ordered meat from a slaughterhouse, kosher meat, non-glut. But they insisted that the slaughterhouse send the forequarter of the animal, the front half of the animal. We only use the forequarter of meat because the hind quarter, the back of the animal, contains certain uh, veins and certain fats that we're not allowed to eat, and therefore it is not economically viable to take the time and effort to remove them. So, practically speaking, the hind quarter of animals virtually always just goes to the non-kosher line. And so only the forequarter goes to kosher processing. And the forequarter excludes the last rib, the bottom rib. That bottom rib goes with the hind quarter. That's the dividing line. The bottom rib is attached to non-kosher fats and it goes with the hind quarter to the non-kosher line. But this large non-glot processor insisted that the slaughterhouse send the forequarter with the last rib attached because they say it improves the taste of their product. But it's just not proper according to Jewish law. Another example. There's a cautious organization that holds the opinion that grape juice does not need to be kosher. Now, normative Jewish law clearly holds that grape juice is treated exactly like wine. It needs kosher supervision. It is clearly stated like this in the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. But this cautious organization would allow any grape juice, even if there's no certification to be used in their products. And this has massive consequences because every product which lists natural flavoring or natural coloring often is using grape juice. And if the grape juice is not certified, then according to normative Jewish law, it is not permitted. So any product with those ingredients, natural coloring or natural flavoring, that is supervised by this company is not recommended because it violates normative Jewish law. One last example for today, though there are many, many more that we need to discuss. Perhaps we'll find another time to discuss more of them. Extra virgin olive oil is produced in plants that only produce olive oil, and therefore extra virgin olive oil only does not require any kosher supervision. Any extra virgin olive oil is fine. However, all other oils, canola oil, peanut oil, corn, vegetable oil, vegetable shortening, they are all produced in giant plants that make a variety of oils, including non-kosher beef and pork fat. Now, inside these plants, if you were to visit one of these plants, you will see above a maze of pipes, hundreds, thousands of pipes going in every single direction that carry different oils, kosher and non-kosher, through different stages of production. And different oils go through the same pipes at different times, one after the other. The only way to produce kosher oil properly is to have dedicated lines, dedicated pipes, which are used only for kosher oil. And those pipes need to be marked and they need to be checked regularly and carefully 
by someone who is an expert at the processing and the engineering and the layout of the plant. There is no other way to produce kosher oil in a proper manner. And there is this one kosher organization in particular that does not require dedicated lines, dedicated pipes for the kosher oil that they supervise. The problem is, by law, for example, in North America, if the label says 100% pure vegetable oil, by law, that product is allowed to contain up to 4% beef or pork fat. And that happens due to the residue left in the pipe between processing non-kosher oil and then kosher oil. There's leftover, there's residue. It's not that they add non-kosher oil to the kosher oil on purpose, but there's residue. And it's inevitable if you're using the same pipe for one kind of oil after another. So any product that contains oil or shortening with this particular kosher symbol should not be used. Some people think that the more visibly Jewish a certifying rabbi is, the more trustworthy they are. A longer beard, a bigger black hat, a longer black coat. If a person or an organization is a Haredi organization or a Hasidish organization, sadly, that is not true for several reasons. One is some kashris organizations are run by very religious people, very pious people, but they don't have the technical knowledge or the scientific resources to properly evaluate sophisticated ingredients and machinery. And it gets more and more complicated every single day. So the answer to the question, what should I do? Who should I follow? The answer to that question is from the famous line in Pirkei Avos, you have to make for yourself a rabbi. You have to decide on an expert. Someone with expertise in kashras in a, in a contemporary setting. Someone that you trust to give the correct answer, even if it's not the answer you want. That is the only way to properly keep kosher today. My friends, I want to wish you a great day, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.